You can open your Bibles to Acts 4, 36 through 37. And this is a portion in God's Word where the first church, the first century church, did a remarkable thing. People were having everything in common, selling their possessions uh, to give to the church as a community, and they literally, what was mine was yours, and what yours was mine. And if you want to wake up in church or wake somebody else, just start telling about them how your, your, their possessions are somebody else's. You want someone to get a little fidgety. But it was certainly a miracle. Acts 4, 36 through 37. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for every moment we can come together in your word, your life-giving, your life-changing word that changes us to be like Christ, the very meaning of life. Thank you for this moment that we can worship you, that your grace has led us here, and that your spirit shapes us here. And we pray that your word would be heard, and anything that hinders your word, especially me, let it get out of the way and not be heard in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, with it being graduation Sunday, I wanted to encourage everyone to give good gifts to your grads, to give a special gift to our grads, and not just the gift of maybe a card with some money in it that you just so beautifully expresses how you feel about them, how proud you are of them. Maybe expresses better than what you could have. Uh, not, not, I'm not talking about a card, but I'm, some, I'm talking about something that will have a lasting, far-reaching impact. A gift that almost is like a butterfly effect that can flow not just to that graduate's life, but into the lives of others that they encounter throughout their life. A gift that we all need in order to be strong followers of Christ, and that a lot of times seems to be in short supply. Now, although you can buy a lot of peculiar things on Amazon, and even a baby brother, someone said, once, as crazy as that is. This is a commodity that cannot be sold on Amazon. It cannot be packaged and and sold. It's actually a gift that the Apostle Paul received that helps him write almost half of the New Testament and to be such a devoted and influential servant of Christ. This is the gift of encouragement. Encouragement is certainly something we all need time to time in our walks with Christ. And especially for our graduates that are being thrown into the world, scary, dark world that doesn't appear to be getting any more godly. You know, USA Today posted that 70%, and I might even say more, but 70% of all people before the age of 23, stop attending church. By the time they turn 23, 70% of people. And the top reasons they gave were, number one, they want a break from church, a vacation from church. Number two, the members are judgmental and hypocritical. Number three, they moved to college, which actually sometimes can go the other way. You move to college, you get out of your comfort zone, and you find a different group of believers, and it just ignites your faith. But a lot of times, that doesn't happen. And four, uh, busy with work. We don't live in a busy world, do we? Number five, They felt disconnected with church members. 
Well, we see plenty of different reasons here. And maybe some of these could have been prevented if the youth, those graduating, going out into the world would see how much we desire to know them, how much we care for them and want to encourage them. Maybe something as little as buying them a lunch after church. Or maybe before they graduate from high school, buying them a lunch after high school, buying them a meal after school. Or maybe even with permission, going to the school and taking a lunch to them. Imagine uh, how much that perception, uh, their perception might, might change. You know, there's one thing we learn actually uh, driving the school bus, we, a lot of things we learn, of course. Uh, but one, one big thing that we are taught, one thing that we are taught uh, is that, you know, we, we should be careful not to always be saying, don't do this, don't do that, sit down, be quiet. Um, not always giving those negative feedback, but also, they say three positive for every one negative, Right? But actually going out of your way and say, hey, you know, you know how, how did school go today? Or, you know, asking them, showing that you actually care. It doesn't have to be anything big, but really just something that isn't negative. And then just like with, with doctors, they go to a doctor's office, and those that are victims, victims of uh, maybe some kind of male practice, medical male practice, well, recent, uh, research has shown that, uh, that a, a victim of such is much, much less likely to sue the hospital if their doctor was nice to them and actually showed they genuinely cared about them and didn't look at them as a, as a number. The, the numbers for lawsuits against hospitals go down, goes down a lot when they have a good, when the doctor has a good relationship with, the, with, the, with their client, I guess you would say, their patient. Well, I wonder, if, with number two up there, about the second reason about leaving churches because of members being judgmental or hypocritical, I wonder if we had a stronger relationship with such people, such young people, if that would prevent uh, them from perceiving us as judgmental. Because, hey, all of us, at some level, were judgmental or a hypocrite because nobody's in here perfect. Just given the right amount of time, enough time, someone will see, and you'll see yourself that you're a hypocrite of some sort. So if we can change the perception by deepening relationships and showing, being intentional, showing that we care, that'll be a gift of encouragement that may even prevent someone from leaving, leaving the church all together. I love Psalm 133, as you might know by now. And it's a psalm that really speaks about, about unity, Christian unity, not uniformity, everybody trying to be and look the same, but being one, different people becoming one, not celebrating or agreeing with Christian unity, but actually dwelling together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is Brethren, for those that dwell together in unity. It actually says God commands his blessing. That means the power of God. You can't, you're not going to be able to stop it. If we're, if we're seeking true unity, whether it's generational unity or any type of unity in diversity, uh, we can expect the power, the power of God. Now, I, know, I know I'm preaching, preaching to the choir because I know you guys, you do an awesome job of encouraging our youth. But sometimes, sometimes the choir can fall asleep. Sometimes we can fail at our greatest strength. Now I know the older that I get, it is easier, becomes more easier to become more critical and judgmental or impatient with the younger generations. That being a fault finder seems to come natural. Not something I really have to work at. Now, to be an encourager, 
as we know, that is not something that comes by accident. That's something we have to be intentional and that it requires work. Well, thankfully, we have a God who is a God that doesn't just command us to encourage one another and comfort one another, but he actually leads the way, goes out of his way to encourage us. I think that is best seen, of course, at the cross when Jesus left all his great comforts so that we could be comforted. When he started his ministry also, 40 days of fasting, he left many comforts to relate to us in our temptations. But I'd like to, sh to show how God is one God, is a God of encouragement by what is revealed in Isaiah, chapter, um, chapter 42, uh, verse 3. Now, this is a chapter foretelling of Jesus, speaking of Jesus here. Isaiah says, a bruised reed he will not break, Jesus will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not snuff out. During Isaiah's day, as they tended their father's sheep in the wilderness, young boys, they would leave the hills from where the sheep were and go down to the Jordan, to the Jordan River. And at the Jordan, there would be these, these reeds. And, you know, back then, they didn't, have, uh, they didn't have Snapchat. They didn't have any kind of video game or any, any kind of social media to, to kill time with. Or what? I'm sorry. <laughs> so what they do, they, uh, they use their creativity, and they took these reeds, and they turned them into flutes. And so they would, they, they would hollow them out, turn them into flute, and, and play them as a flute. And if it got bruised in any way or broken, it didn't make it sound anymore. So they had to, uh, instead of repairing it, since there were thousands of these reeds to choose from, they just throw it out and get a new one. Now also in this verse, we see uh, a, smoldering, a smoldering wick. Now back then, since there was no electricity in, in Isaiah's day, what, what would happen is you had, to, you, you had to light your home with these oil lamps, as you can see up there. And when the oil started to get low, the wick would start to smolder, and you'd get, a lot of, you'd get a lot of smoke. And so back then, it was the woman's job uh, to, to go and, I mean, the guy's job is always to take out the trash, right? <laughs> no matter what culture you're in, the guy takes out the trash. Well, th back then, the woman's responsibility, one of them was to, to fill the oil lamp up. So she would fill it up, and instead of relighting the old wick, since she had hundreds of them, she just threw out the old one and put a, put a fresh, fresh one in there. Well, Isaiah shows us with the bruised reed and the smoldering wick, shows us a lot about God's heart and the kind of people that he came for. The word bruised in Hebrew actually means coming apart at the seams, discouraged, a loss of hope. A person bruised so deeply by the wor world that their lives are falling apart. Wounded emotionally or physically, sexually or even spiritually. Wounded so much in either one of these or maybe even all of them that they think they have no more options in life. And in their desperate cry out to the world, what does the world do? discards them, throws them away, says, I, there's nothing you can do for me, and just gets rid of them. Well, if that happens to be you today, and the best way to describe you now might be wounded, that the pain is so bad that you do not know what to do. We have good news, that Jesus, the Savior, the ruler of all, who controls all things, came for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. He loved the world so much that he gave his son 
that whoever believes in him, not believes in their situation, believes and trusts in him, will have everlasting life. Now, smoldering, smoldering, as we see it in the Hebrew there, is pretty much means a dying flame. It's where we get the phrase burnt out from. This Hebrew word uh, is one that really talks about a person that was once a big deal. I know there's a few big deals in here right now, or at least people that think they're a big deal. But someone that was very active, had a lot of dreams, a lot of hopes, passion, enthusiasm, but no longer does. They feel that their, their purpose in life is gone. Well, if that happens to be you, I do, I also have good news that Christ came for such people. He is the author and the giver of eternal life, an abundant life full of purpose. And speaking to the younger generations who happen at times to leave relationships, jobs, commitments, because they don't feel there's any purpose in them, the good news I have is no matter what menial work you may have, whatever you put in the hands of the Lord is nothing small if it's being used for the Lord. If you're working at it with all your heart, all your soul as if working for the Lord, you're, you are being a vessel used by the Lord, and you have amazing purpose no matter when you see the fruit of your purpose. Because people are seeing God, no matter where your workplace may be, whatever relationship you're in, or whatever commitment, people will see that if you're using it for the Lord. We have to constantly remind us ourselves each day, I'm here, God put me here, in this neighborhood, at this job, at this school, for a reason, and I need to find it. And in, in, do, in so doing, using what we have for the Lord, we'll find out uh, that it is full of purpose. I mean, think of the little boy who had a lunch, the feeding of the 5,000, just a little lunch that he gave to the Lord, and look at what happened. Put it into the hands of Jesus, it multiplied, and fed over 5,000, probably about 15,000, hungry people, and it's in every, that, that story is in every single gospel. Not every story makes the, each Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but that one, that one and the resurrection are the only two miracles that are in all four gospels, and I'm sure that boy never thought just giving that little lunch would do such an impact. Or maybe the man that lent Jesus his donkey Two men, two gophers. Jesus says, go, go, get, go, get these, uh, go get this donkey for me. I'm like, oh, Jesus, I thought we were going to change the world. Not go get donkeys. Get donkeys for you. And there's a guy, so the guy, Jesus made plans for the donkey to be used. And he rode into Jerusalem, uh, as we know, the triumphal entry, showing that he is the humble king. And he came to serve. And, and that fulfilled prophecy. So we never know what menial little thing that we do that may seem unimportant. You never know what God will do with it or the plans he has with it. But if we put anything into the hands of the Lord, it, it has great purpose. Now I share this because to show that we have a God of encouragement. Second Corinthians says that God, he is the God of all, what is it? Comfort. But the Greek word for comfort is periklesis, the, the Greek word used there. It's the same, it can be translated as not just comfort, but it can also be encouragement or admonishment or to come alongside somebody. So as we give encouragement to others, we are being, we are taking one step closer to our walk with Christ, we're acting like the one we were, whose image we bear. We're one step closer to being like him, for he's the God of all comfort, the God of all 
encouragement. And any real encouragement there is in this world stems from the, our creator. Because he wired us that way, too. And I, I'm sure many of you in here know that as you go to bless somebody else, especially if you've done any kind of local or abroad missions, you go to bless somebody else, and guess what? You're the one that gets more blessed in the process. So in doing that, and trying to bless and encourage somebody else, we find our purpose as well. But we also get ignited in our faith. Well, the devil, he has a lot of tricks, of course. I'm sure plenty of us know. Hopefully we've seen that because we're engaged in the fight. The devil tries his best for us to think that God is a God of disappointment or one who lo whose love we must earn by our performance. And if you think that, if you think God is just this, this guy, this old guy with, on steroids that wants to always find out what you're doing wrong, if you do that, why would you ever want to come to him? It kind of makes sense. That tactic kind of makes sense because the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is more or less to call the Holy Spirit evil, because what was going on at the time, people were saying Jesus was casting out demons in the name of Satan, but no, he was using the finger of of God. So blasphemy, part of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is calling God evil. And if you think God is evil and not good, then why would you come to him? That he, if the Holy Spirit is your only way to convict you and convince you of who Christ is, your only way of salvation, then that's the, un, the, unfor, for, the unforgivable sin. Uh, it's the unforgivable sin because he is, Christ is, on, is your only way. So do not be deceived thinking that God doesn't have your best interest, that he is the God of disappointment. And you know, there's no one in this world or in this universe that has suffered more character assassination than God has. But thankfully, he has proven and thankfully he has shown that he is the God of encouragement. Jesus shows in John 15 and gives a name to the Holy Spirit, which is, well, it's, well, what it's not is, he doesn't say, and when the disappointed one comes, or when the discourager comes, or the angry one comes. No, he says, when the comforter comes, the encourager, the advocate, when he comes, he will testify about me. The Greek word there that he used, that Jesus used, was parakletos, which could be translated comforter or encourager or admonisher or one who comes alongside. One that is for you, not against you. One that has come to lift you up, not to beat you down. Not to say that he doesn't convict us of sin, but the, the, the purpose in showing us where we're wrong when the Spirit shows us our sin is so that we can find the better way because he, there is a better way, the way to eternal life. Well, the text I chose, as you guys read, you might think this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> think what does this have to do with Acts 4, verses 36 and 37. Well, I chose, I chose this verse because it speaks of an amazing example, a man by the name of Barnabas, who got a wonderful nickname. Uh, his nickname that he got was Son of Encouragement. And the reason why I wanted to look at him today is because he's a fallen human being just like us. And if he can be one known as one of encouragement, then that gives us courage and gives us hope that we can do the same as we trust in the Lord. It's, it's, it's interesting that the word used here, it almost sounds like the word used for Holy Spirit, which is periklesios. So it's almost identical to the same word Jesus used for the Holy Spirit. It's almost as if they said he's a son of encouragement, a son of the Holy Spirit, a chip off the old block. He looks just like the one that he follows the great comforter, the great encourager. 
the Holy Spirit. So as we look, as we look at Barnabas, we put together, I have marks of being an encourager as we look at Barnabas so that we can be one of those people that lighten up a room when we walk into it and not walk out of it. Because you can be either one. You can light up a room when you walk into it or you can lighten it up when you leave. First one, encouragers don't dwell in their past. Barnabas was a man that grew up, his name was Joseph, he, Joseph of Cyprus. He grew up in a place called Cyprus, and Cyprus was not the greatest, most peaceful, quiet place to live in. It was kind of a, what did we call it, Kira? Uh, ghetto? Oh, yeah. Is that what we said in Sunday school? Well, it was just something else. Maybe the hood. <laughs> not a good place to live, to live in. Could have easily, Barnabas could have easily been a negative fault finder because of his hard past where he grew up. And not only did he grow up in Cyprus, but he was a Levite that grew up in Cy Cyprus. Levites were temple assistants that had to keep rigid rules. You ever wonder why the good, in the story of the Good Samaritan, when the Levite Cross. He had to go to the other side of the road, probably partly because they're not allowed to be anywhere near anything that's dead or dying. So that might have been part of why Jesus included him in that way. But Levites were people, rigid rule keepers that probably you didn't want to have around too much, probably didn't lift you up too often. Maybe they often said, I'm better than you, I work at the temple. And they could easily find fault in others. And then that's a temptation for us as we grow in our, in our sanctification. We can easily be tempted to look, oh, look how much better I am than somebody else. So Barnabas, Barnabas could have easily been a Levite from Cyprus, could have been, an, could have been a fault finder, big time. <coughs> but no, instead, he didn't let his, future, he didn't let his, dic his past dictate his future. He let God dictate his future. He let the Holy Spirit, he submitted to the Spirit and became an encourager. Mark number two, encouragers don't dwell in your past. We all know that before Paul became Paul, he was Saul. And when people heard that name Saul, especially Christians of that time, they got scared because he sought not to pray with Christians but to persecute Christians to imprison them and then maybe even put them to death. So they probably saw him and once he said that he was a believer, that he was probably trying to be some kind of Trojan horse to just get in to the community so that he can destroy it. But there's someone that came alongside him and said, No, no, trust me, Barnabas, Barnabas comes and says, He's legit. He's legit. Barnabas came and he, and he told the other believers, he was an advocate for Paul saying, yeah, I know you guys are scared of him, but no, he's for real. He's got evidence of the Holy Spirit and he's a follower of Christ. Imagine if Barnabas did not stick up for Paul. Imagine if he didn't encourage Paul and the other believers. Would we have almost half of the New Testament today that Paul wrote? And by the way, Barnabas also accepted Mark. And Mark went on a missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas. And as they go on their journey, he deserts them. He deserted them. I don't know why. Maybe he thought missions would be easy. Maybe he was just too young. And maybe he just missed home. Whatever, whatever the reason was, he deserted Paul and Barnabas on their mission. And so as he wants to do it again... Paul says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So Paul says, I'm not taking him. He's not coming with us. And so what happens is Barnabas takes him, and they go separate ways. Paul takes Silas, goes on a missionary journey with him, and then Barnabas 
and Mark go on a separate one. And thankfully, eventually, Paul in 2 Timothy, we see that he got over it. We see that as he says, hey, oh, can you guys make sure, can you bring, make sure John Mark comes here? Because I found him to be useful. So he eventually got over it. But I bet you all that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Barnabas, the son of encouragement. The third mark of an encourager is they've experienced the third conversion. Luther speaks of three different conversions that the believer must experience. First, the conversion of the mind. Second, the conversion of the heart. And lastly, the conversion of the wallet. The conversion of the wallet. Barnabas sure did that. He sold an entire field. He sold his whole field and gave all the money to the apostles. He didn't have to do that, but he did it. And encouragers, they'll use their money to encourage others, to, for other believers to see how serious they are, but not, not for looks, but to share, to further the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So encouragers don't just say good words, but they show encouragement through what they do. And lastly, encouragers get out of the way. Encouragers get out of the way. In the book of Acts, we see that when Barnabas and Paul were mentioned together, it was always Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul went on to Antioch. Barnabas and Paul uh, went on this missionary journey or healed this person or dealt with this Jewish sorcerer. It was Barnabas and Paul. But then in Acts 15, something changed. It started to become Paul and Barnabas, showing that now Paul was the one leading. Well, of course, it's the Holy Spirit, but Paul was the number one submitted person to the Holy Spirit, taking directions from the Spirit. So encouragers get out of the way. See, Barnabas could have got all petty, right? He could have said, oh, you're not taking my ministry. This is my ministry. I've been doing this for 20 years. You don't step in. But no, Barnabas said, go ahead. Because it wasn't about Barnabas. It was about furthering the kingdom. It was about God. So he got out of the way. And he went where God led him. Well, to conclude here, I want to share a story. Back in 1973, I wasn't born yet then, but a friend of mine told me, back in 1973, the market crashed. 45% of its value, does anybody remember that? 45% of its value went down. That's almost half. I'm not a math, mathematician, but that's, that's almost half. 45%. And this led to plenty of shortages in our country. A shortage in gas and oil, electricity. There were a few blackouts. Hopefully no one experienced that. And that, was, that, that, that word shortage was a hot word. In Japan at that time, there was a... Uh, a, a release of an article that said Japan had a shortage of toilet paper in their country. And they said, this could happen to you, saying to other countries, be ready because this, and you don't want this to happen to you. So that really got people's attentions there. Well, Guy read a different newspaper clipping and got in front of live television on The Tonight Show and was announced by a guy named Ed McMahon who said, here's Johnny, right? It was Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson says on the air, hey, have you heard, you know, we've had, we've had these shortages of electricity, gas, oil, and other things, but now have you heard in toilet paper? Well, this led to the next day stores being cleared of toilet paper. Has anybody witnessed that? 
Anybody seen that? All right. The stores were empty of toilet paper. And this was a perceived scarcity. A perceived scarcity because actually what he read was a shortage in commercial toilet paper. It wasn't personal. It was for businesses. And so it was a perceived scarcity. There was no scarcity. Well, today if you watch the evening news enough with all the wars and all the negative uh, things that are going on in the world and what the media loves to get attention with, you would be caused to think that there is a scarcity of what? A scarcity of hope. You think there's no way. There's no hope. Maybe such perception was given to Aaron Hernandez, who was under trial for murder and ended up committing suicide. Maybe Robin Williams, when, who had Parkinson's disease and committed suicide, maybe he thought there was a scarcity of hope. Think there was no hope in their situations. Well, graduates and fellow believers know there is an abundance of hope. You just need to look in the right place. Not look in being your fittest to live the longest or to work your hardest at whatever college class you go to just to get the better job, to buy more things that are just going to rust out. There's abundance of hope and encouragement in Christ, our hope of glory. But the thing is, you need to go where he is found. You know, the Barna group said 33%, not of people, 33% of Christians say church isn't important. That's a third of Christians said church isn't important. So it's not by accident that in Hebrews 10 we read, do not give up meeting together. Don't give up attending church or fellowship as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. Encouragement is something that we do when we just show up. We encourage each other because we're sharing the same faith. I know a story of a man who had been blind and deaf uh, for something that happened in his life. And for over 20 years, he continued to go to church. Even though he really couldn't communicate to people, he couldn't hear a message, he couldn't sing. If he did sing, it probably wasn't very well or the same song. But he showed up every day because he, and he, asked, he was asked why. He said, well, because I want people to see who I'm following. I want them to see it. So just showing up is an encouragement. And how can you encourage someone if you're binging late night on Netflix till 2 a.m. Saturday night to show up Sunday morning half awake? How can you encourage, how can you be encouraged if you don't show up to where the encouragement is found? It's unlikely you can flesh out encouragement to another believer if you're not around another believer, right? So let us intentionally and selflessly encourage our grads and encourage one another by going out of our ways to deepen our relationships, but also to show up, show up as service, show up in each other's lives to dwell with each other and grow and encourage each other and be shaped by the Holy Spirit and find, in, in so doing, we find eternal life. Let's pray together. Good God, we thank you that you are a God of encouragement. Where would we be today if you weren't? Life would be pointless. But we thank you, God, that you're a God who loves us just the way we are, but loves us too much to let us stay that way. And you encourage us to be like Christ, to know what life's all about. So God, we ask that you continue to work in our hearts and help us to be an encourager, not just for the kingdom's sake, but also for ourselves, that we can grow to know you and be like you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>